So hello everyone. I want to thank you all for being here today and I also want to thank Lina for that great introduction. I just learned this week that we have both been in Yucatan and she knows the marvelous cenotes. And of course I want to thank the Rachel Carson Center for this opportunity um, for sharing and ideas with people from multiple disciplines to think about nature and the non-human animals. And so following the topic of our last colloquium, uh, just like Etienne, I'm going to talk about waste. However, I am not going to talk about human waste, but I will discuss big waste in relation to water and how those two are entangled. And just to clarify, by big waste, I refer to the feces and urine produced by pigs. And before I begin, I just want to say that I was lucky and I am really grateful to have the opportunity to work with the Guardians of the Cenotes, which is a grassroots organization that was created to defend their town, their water, and their cenotes, which are sacred sinkholes uh, from the expansion of the meat industry. The fight has been ongoing for seven years, and it is still open. Uh, my dissertation is about them, about their struggle, their imaginaries of a good life, and how the, their different visions of the cenotes and their demands are protecting this territory using the law. So, as we all know, sorry, okay, I guess I could. As we all know, water is just never just water, and its meaning and value are related to the uses, the needs, the vision, the social organizations and ontologies regarding nature. And law regulates water use, access, and the limits of pollution. And law is also used by different stakeholders to defend and advance their views over water and justice. My research centers on the different imaginaries of water crafted by stakeholders, which include companies, rural communities, scientists, authorities, social movements, and lawyers, in relation to justice, development, and risk. And more specifically, my research analyzes how different actors involving water and territorial conflicts understand underground water aquifers, create knowledge to support their claims, and advance their claims through negotiation, resistance, and the use of law. For this presentation, I will focus on the resistance of the guardians of the cenotes and their meanings, knowledges, and repertoire of resistance. So today, I will analyze how these grassroots organizations understand the cenotes, how do they interact with them, and how they have used law to defend their underground territory from the expansion of the meat industry. And the content of my presentation will be as follows. I will briefly introduce my theoretical framework. Then I will present the hydrosocial space that's currently under dispute. Um, for doing so, I will describe the overlapping territories of the expansion of the meat industry and the ring of cenotes a natural protected area, and the most important underwater reserve. reserve. And I will first would like to present big factories. And for doing so, I will be following the waste to, onto the underground water. And then I will describe the porous karstic system and how big waste drips into a synopsis. Then I will describe my specific case study, the community of Comun, a community whose livelihood is based on the tourism of cenotes, but also the first Mayan community who ha has presented a lawsuit against Gayfus. And then I will uh, see how the law interacts with the cenotes and the waste, and for doing so, I will discuss the question of pollution, risk, and the precautory principle. Then uh, I will analyze self-determination and the rights of indigenous people to decide on their development model. And then I will discuss the possible recognition of the ring of cenotes as a subject of a special protection to finally present my closing regards. So for thinking about the ring of cenotes, I will just to use the concept of hydrosocial territories. But to start and to begin, we need to understand the hydrosocial water cycle and how it has challenged the neutrality of the hydrologic cycle by questioning what water is, and by adding the natural, to the natural circulation of water, the human involvement. In this image, we can see the so-called natural water cycle here in this side, and then on the other side, we can see the influence on many different human activities. We have, of course, the pigs and the cafos, but we also have 
hotels, cities, and so on. And this framework argues that to understand water, we need to analyze the social natural process by which water and society make and remake each other. Through different processes, H2O, which is water materiality, correlates to social power, technology, and infrastructure influencing each other. So hydrosocial um, territories take this definition and add the layer of space. According to Bolens et al., uh, hydrosocial territories are multi-scalar networks in which water flows, hydrologic infrastructure, legal and administrative and financial system, but also social, cultural institutions and practices interactly produce, negotiate, and contest these spaces. So the focus of this approach is not only to analyze the dominant uh, imaginaries, but also the multiple diverse and conflictive views over water in the same territory. In one hydrosocial space, we can have multiple territories competing or collaborating over the meaning, value, and use of water. In the natural protected area of the Ring of Cenotes, there are multiple different and competing social territories. On one hand, we have the concentrated animal feeding operations and the local government that argue that with the use of technology, such as water treatment plants, biodigesters, they can minimize the negative impacts of CAFOs to the underwater reserve. This is a technical and managerial view. And on the other hand, we have Mayan communities, feminist movements, vegans, NGOs, and environmentalists that are challenging this mainstream narrative of CAFOs as an efficient and environmentally friendly technology by exhibiting the risk of pollution of water due to peak waste and the many negative impacts on the industry. These communities are defending the natural sinkholes, the notice, as sacred places that deserve to have a special protection while placing themselves as the guardian. And as we can see in this poster that was done by a human rights defender, um, we can consider these to be the higher social territories with different stakeholders. Here we have the company, here we have the state, the people that are competing over the different visions and how the cenotes should be taken care for. So as today I was saying, I am going to talk about the hydrosocial territories from below, because today I will be focusing on the resistance of the Guardian of the Cenotes, rather than the dominant views of the companies and the government, which I cover in other chapters of my dissertation. And for understanding underground hydrosocial territorialities, I want to use three concepts, social territorial movements, territories for life, and counter-hegemonic litigation. So when focusing on social movement, Fernandez has created this category of a social territorial movement, which is a social movement whose identity, its main objectives, and its strategies are deeply connected with the territory and their material and symbolic values. Although the analysis of social territorial movements have been usually used for law, uh, for land and understanding land, I believe it is a useful framework to think about water movements and water territories. And the concept of territories for life also contributes by giving us a perspective on how territorial and water movements are fighting for the reproduction of life, not only of the human, but also the not human. Latin American feminist political ecologies have defined territories of life as those putting life at the center in sharp contrast with the capitalist logic of economic growth. So, the Guardian of the Cenotes are a hydrosocial territorial movement that is based upon the relationship with the underground water. The Mayan culture for centuries had had a particular relation with the Cenotes as a space of respect. Cenotes have provided spaces of protection and been key for the development of different forms of livelihood, including beekeeping, small-scale agriculture, and now tourism. Finally, given that today I'm going to talk about the social territorial movement uh, protecting the cenotes, I will also analyze law from below. And following Rodriguez, Garavito, and Arenas, law is used from below in grounded forms of resistance, pushing for legal innovation by excluded populations. Mostly their analysis focused on indigenous people against extractives. For indigenous people, counter hegemonic use of law illustrates how a place-based identity movement can use national and international law for the creation of new rights, to challenge legal perspectives that are based on property, and to push for collective rights, as well as to defend their territories. I recognize that social movements and law have a complex relationship. 
law can create and enable the dominant status quo, and in many cases, it does. There is also a growing number of cases in which law has been used to criminalize human rights defenders and social movements. But nevertheless, law can also provide a space of resistance in different scales with different results. And by exploring the grounded visions of justice, the use of law through counter-hegemonic litigation, or desde abajo, and taking seriously the role of underground water as an actant, part of the social movement, we can understand the possibilities and difficulties water movements are facing regarding law from a more critical and grounded approach. So let me move to my case and explain a little the hydrosocial territory on this field. So, uh, concentrated animal feeding operations, I don't know how familiar people are with meat production, uh, but they are part of the current dominant and expanding food regime, the grain, oil, seed, livestock complex, through which the grain and oil seeds, we mainly soy, transgenic, genetically modified soy and maize, are used to feed the growing number of food animals that we have on that photo. This food regime incorporates the production of meat under an economic growth imperative that relies upon the multiple and chronic biophysical contradictions to increase the productivity of humans, the soil, the water, and the non-human animals. The production of meat under this capitalist logic is one of the largest contributions of climate change. It drives deforestation, pollutes water, soil, and air, is associated with land grabbing, creates many healthy cancers, including pandemics, and is also associated with cruelty against non-human animals. And regardless of its impact, this model has been expanding from the US when it started, in, and it's now the current way of producing meat into other regions, such as Latin America. This agribusiness model also displaces other more sustainable forms of producing food, such as the ones we, I see every day at uh, the farm next to the land house. Here is a photo of some of these pigs. Uh, but also the many agroecological techniques that have been used in Latin America for many, many years and are now being framed by agribusiness as unproductive and inefficient. And so I would like to describe the concentrated animal feeding operation, but mostly I want to follow the waste. So CAFOs, our concentrated animal feeding operations, are industrial meat production operations that basically combine thousands of pigs in a closed space uh, where they get a lot of antibiotics and I live in, in very complicated, overcrowded, mistreatment and unsanitary situations. And the floors are made of concrete with a um, hollow out area where the big waste can flow. And so they use the so-called flush system which is basically using water in order to push the, uh, the waste through pipes into the lagoons. Farm waste, which is highly toxic, accumulates in these lagoons with a capacity of thousands of liters, and the lagoons can be open, that's the worst case scenario, and this photo, or close. This method of water storage threatens water quality because manure can leach into the groundwater, or if there's a heavy rainfall or a hurricane, and Yucatan is a zone of like typhoons and hurricanes, they can just overflow a rupture and large amounts of manure will be freed. The waste then passes from the lagoons into the irrigation system, which distributes the polluted water to the soil, in some cases directly to the forest or the rainforest, but also to grasslands or crops. The system basically works for sprinkles that irrigates waste for many hours into multiple hectares. And so we can imagine that by concentrating thousands of pigs in a limited area, there is a massive production of waste. And as a result, an individual CAFO can generate more waste than a human population. So just to give you an idea, a CAFO of 80,000 pigs will generate 330,000 uh, 30,000 million, no, 30 million kilograms of manure a year, which for you to know is the same amount of waste that the whole population of Los Angeles or LA will generate. And we also need to understand that CAFOs are not isolated entities, but are part of a system where hundreds of CAFOs, hundreds of these facilities are connected by roads, ports, and other facilities, including slaughterhouses and processing plants. 
and therefore their pigs, their fed, their meat, but mostly their waste is all circulating through the region of Yucatan. Typically, a single company will uh, control this industry through vertical integration and contract farming. The company delivers the piglets to hundreds of contractors and then gets them back when they are ready to be slaughtered. By doing so, they attempt to delegate risk and their responsibility for pollution. So Yucatan, as you will see through the photos, has an almost unique car soil, rocky and porous and shallow that facilitates the direct sweepage of wastewater from, uh, from peak CAFOs into the most important hydrological groundwater reserve in the country, the Ring of Cenotes, on which the entire population of Yucatan depends. The low level of retention and absorption of the karstic soil has been documented by, by many authors, including Bautista and Duarte. And of course, you cannot simply flush waste and make it disappear. And given the quantities of big waste that are produced and the karstic soil, most of these waste will end up in the underground water. So as we can see, it generates a huge problem. And in Yucatan, pig production has always been part of the rural economy. However, recently it has become industrialized and it has expanded. From 2016 to 2018, there was a 39,000% growth. In 2020, Greenpeace did the first study and identified 250 large pig farms in the state. Today, the federal government has done a study and identified 231 facilities, which at least one warehouse. 23 of these facilities have, tw uh, have at least 20 warehouses, which are massive complexes of meat production. And the fact that today we do not have um, the knowledge of the exact number of the exact number of pig factories and their location reflects how the government for many years now has promoted meat production as a development model that will generate employment and also have minimized the impacts of the CAFOs in a region that they categorize with having large quantities of water. In fact, only 18 of these pig factories have an environmental impact assessment. So now I would like to talk about the other part, the underground or the ring of cenotes. So according to the Mayan culture and cosmology, the cenotes are inhabited by guardians of the mountains and the ones who bring rain, and also by these playful spirits called alushes. The water from the cenotes is used in many different ceremonies, but just to mention a few, it's used at the chakak for bringing rain, but also at the slum, which is necessary to ask permission in order to live in a region or a place. And for years, the cenotes and the Mayan communities have had a close relationship. Genotes have also provided the water for the many rural transitions in Yucatan. And the state finally recognized the importance of the cenotes and in 2013 declared the natural state protected area of the Ring of Cenotes, which is composed of 220,000 hectares, multiple municipalities, including Homun. Just for you to know, uh, the Ring of Cenotes is also a Ramsar site which means that it's recognized by international law because of its high biodiversity as an important wetland. So the mega infrastructure of peak factories I previously described overlaps with the ring of cenotes. So at least 80% of these farms are inside. This is the ring of cenotes. But many, many, many farms are in a two kilometer buffer from a cenote. You can see them here. And so the massive amount of waste produced by these factories will drip into the underground water, traveling through the systems or these interconnected rivers into the ocean and affecting minim impacting many different communities. Now let me go to the second section of my pres presentation and briefly introduce the resistance of Homun. So Homun might refer to a bottomless place. And basically this is because in that town there's at least 300 cenotes. Uh, the community of Homun is located in the center of the reserve of the Ring of Cenotes, and since 2016, they have been opposing a 49,000 pig factory. In 2018, they won a suspension, but the case is still open and the factory has not been canceled. So now let me go to this interaction of the pig waste and cenotes with the law. As I have said before, there is a complex relationship of social movements with law. In many cases, law does not incorporate or limits the social movement demands. 
and uses different evaluation systems. It also defines who can be a claimant, what can be claimed, and what counts as evidence. So for analyzing the relations on law and big ways, I will discuss a specific issues that have defined the terms of the debate surrounding cables. Big waste and risk of pollution, self-determination and the right for deciding on how a community wants to develop, and the right to nature. So first, regarding the right to a healthy environment, pollution has become the main issue. The discussion has been around waste, temporalities, and the capacity of this karstic porous system to process the massive amount of waste from CAFOs. Against the techno-managerial discourse of water plants being enough to control pollution, the people from Hamun have managed to challenge the narrative with their knowledge and mobilize expert witnesses to court. By doing so, they have managed to exhibit the risk of pollution to cenotes that CAFOs will generate. For doing so, they contrast the current situation with a dystopian future in which cenotes are so polluted that their environment destruction cannot be reversed. The pollution of water is also connected to the bodies of humans and non-humans and their health. Water pollution from peaks has, has been said before, has a high amount of nitrate, phosphor that can result in many diseases. The porosity of the karstic system and the impossibility for technology to solve the conflict is exemplified by the words of one of the members of the grassroots organization of Comun, the Guardians of the Cenotes, and a woman that considers herself the guardian of the Cenotes, Santa Maria. And you can see a picture of Santa Maria. So I will read the quote. In the cenote, the cenote is my neighbor living for more than 38 years next to a natural place, next to a cenote, have made me realize the changes that cenotes have every season, every month. Not all the time the cenotes are the same way. In the rainy season, in the seasons when the soil is wet enough, the water starts to filter from everywhere. That has made me think that if the farm, because of its size and the number of animals it will have, at some point opens, tomorrow we're going to see the cenotes polluted. Black water, dirty water, it must go somewhere. It must go through all the canals of the earth, through all its layers. It has to, and at some point, it's going to reach the cenotes. As we see from the previous testimony, for the community, protecting a cenote is key, and they are afraid their permeable material and porous properties will be vulnerable to the massive amount of waste. Their local knowledge and experience with the cenotes warned them against the official discourse of the company that cutting edge technology, basically water treatment plants, can guarantee the safety that of the CAFO's operation. And many academic studies documenting the impacts of CAFO and water pollution support this view. For the case of Hamun, expert witnesses have presented evidence of water pollution, hydrology, and topography. And, as the, and just as the human right defender said, I will now put the testimony of an expert. So, the cenotes that we see on the surface are the topographic expression that the subsoil is very dissolved, very calcified with cavities. In these areas, there is a great interconnection. So when we have swallow soils, we have a large number of cenotes. These are areas of high vulnerability. Any pollutant that enters a cenote or the soil surrounding the cenote will go directly to the aquifer and will travel to other areas. One of the effects of this mega meat industry is that it contaminates with organic matter. Legally, the precautory principle contributes to translating the risk into action by requesting a court the suspension and the cancellation of a CAFO based upon the risk to the environmental and human health that these technologies represent in the case of Hamun. Local children, represented by their mothers, have argued that there is a strong risk to damage natural, the natural protected area of the Ring of Cenotes, and their livelihoods and culture depends on, and therefore damaging their futures. Their claims have been supported by scientists who exhibit the porosity of the Ring of Cenotes and the vulnerability. The result has been the suspension that today is still stopping the farm to open. Now. Regarding the different territorial projects, the Mayan communities are advancing more than protecting the cenotes from pollution. They are also advancing the right to decide over their territory, including the underground and the model of development they prefer. 
As a form of livelihood, the community of Comun works in ecotourism, and around 20 cenotes are open to tourists also providing services such as cabin, restaurant, guides, and transportation, which have resulted in many of the families of the town depending directly or indirectly from this activity. The natural reserve, which was created by the state, has been appropriated by this community, which has promoted this form of development. And the community has used law to strengthen their fight for their livelihoods and their indigenous right to decide over the development they want in their territories, including the underground. As an indigenous territory, they complained that no one asked them if they wanted a cave full, and no one informed them of the consequences. In Homun, a self consultation procedure was organized to ask the town if they give permission to the owner of the pig farm to continue working in the territory. The result was 732 votes against and 50 yes in favor. Therefore, there was a resounding no to the installation of this mega pig farm. The resistance against the farm and the defense of cenotes also presents another way of relating to water, but also to the state. In the works of a local leader, here in Comun, our whole area is like a stringer. It fills us the water, our cenotes have tunnels, everything filters. We know it and we cannot let the farm open. We know what it will destroy. Everything is connected, everything filters. The people are going to be damaged, the people are going to suffer. As a town, we have already decided. We are confronting the government, the companies, but the people are in charge. And must defend water. The people are going to rule. We are going to show the government that we have the reason and dignity to defend water. This vision goes forward and to just protecting the cenotes from pollution, to include claims on how and why cenotes should be protected. These are the reivindication from a territorial movements that also challenges decision making over their space. For doing so, they use the human right of self-determination. The process of consultation was key for strengthening the movement. However, the claims has not been equally well received by court. Now, in this hydrosocial territory under dispute, one of the main tensions is between different ontological views. Seeing the cenotes as a source of water or a biocultural patrimony. Recently, a court granted another suspension against the pig farm based on a lawsuit presented by the same community for their recognizing the rights to nature of the ring of cenotes. This new, this new lawsuit reflects the need to understand water territories as territories for life at this, in which life is at the center of the debate, and they also challenge existence and resistance. By that, I mean alternatives. To put life in the center takes into account the different ontologies, changes the imaginary over water territories by recognizing that cenotes are a living system made up of interconnections. And the Mayan people have lived in close, ancestral, spiritual, cultural, and economic relationships them, with them. Recognizing the ring of cenotes challenges the divide between the human and the non-human. It also entails the recognition that nature has the right to stand in court and to be represented for its defense. The ruling also connects the cenotes to the Mayan people. Given the special relationship of the Mayan communities with the cenotes, they are claiming to be the guardians. And guardianship is understood through an ethic of care in which they know and respect them. However, the lawsuit is still in its initial stages and we will do not know what will happen. So to conclude, I would like to say that the social territorial movement of Comun is part of what the Spampa has called the ecological turn in which on one side, there is a certain level of recognition of collective rights like the right to a healthy environment or the right to water. And on the other hand, there's a growing extractivism. Therefore, these territorial movements are resisting both, the dominant views on nature and commodification. In Yucatan, the growing awareness of the importance of the cenotes as biocultural patrimony has been taking place in parallel to the expansion of different projects, including, of course, agribusiness. The law has both contributed to the recognition of the ring on cenotes and, allowed, and at, the same, at the same time allowed for industrial sectors to expand even when they will have a negative impact on the underground water. As we see in the case, so far the use of law through counter-hegemonic litigation has contributed to creating a hydro-social territory that needs protection. Homun has used this kind of litigation, especially human rights, the, the rights to nature approach and environmental law, to defend their hydro-social and advance their hydrological vision. The law also does not incorporate all of the demands of a social movement equally. 
To think of water movements as social territorial movements underlines the relationship of a movement with a particular territory, including water. By doing so, it focuses us to think about grounded visions of justice, in which a group relates to water in a particular way and therefore opens a different option on thinking about the rights to nature and a race dualism between nature and the human. The materiality of the karstic soil, which is porous, shallow, and vulnerable to contamination, has also provided us with an opportunity for thinking about territories in a vertical way, following Ballesteros, and the need to connect the surface with the underground. The struggle of Comun captures the permeability of the whole uh, hydrological social process and blurs the divisions between animals, humans, law, ecological system, and political events. By putting the impacts of CAFOs on the local and national agenda, the case of Homun has also been able to displace the vision of CAFOs as a model of technology that produces sustainable meat. The socio-technical imaginary over CAFOs is now being challenged by, expansion of, by, ch by exposing the commodification of this form of producing meat of the air, water, humans, and non-humans. Finally, I just want to say that I discussed one of the resistance, the case of Homun. But of course, the case of Homun is anchored and connected to many others. Water is fluid underground. And there's many, as I show in a map, CAFOs in Yucatan. Therefore, multiple communities are now raising their voices in order to resist the expansion of agribusiness. Thank you.